A young couple, Jeanette Sue Lyons, just 30 years old, and her husband William Will Lyons IV, only 35, take off in their Cessna 210 after a long day of flying. Both were qualified pilots, the kind of people you'd expect to handle a small airplane without trouble. But within just 90 seconds, the plane slammed into the ground, killing them both, and even their dog. This wasn't an engine failure or a hidden mechanical defect. No, it was a devastating chain of choices, and one terrible decision in particular that sealed their fate. And now, with new toxicology results and pilot records revealed by the NTSB, the story takes an even darker and more disturbing turn. Let's start with a decision that really set the stage for disaster. The couple had already logged about eight and a half hours of flying that day, making fuel stops and pushing across several states. By the time they landed at Cleburne, Aitiburn, Texas, it was dark, it was late, and they were just 21 miles from their final destination. Now here's the kicker. The weather at Cleburne was brutal for a general aviation departure, an overcast ceiling at 300 feet, visibility down to two and a half miles, and pitch black night conditions. Think about that for a second. By the time you clear the runway, you're in the soup almost instantly. No horizon, no lights, no visual reference. You're completely inside the clouds at just a couple hundred feet. This was the go-no-go no go moment, and they went. That was the real terrible decision. Not because it was technically illegal, they had filed IFR and were cleared, but because it was insane from a risk management perspective. After a long day in the cockpit, fatigue stacked up, and then choosing to launch into near-zero visual conditions at night. That's a textbook setup for disaster. They could have waited until morning. They could have stayed overnight. Instead, they tried to squeeze out that last 21 miles, and it cost them everything. So what actually happened once they took off? The ADSB data tells the story in cold numbers. The Cessna climbed out, reaching about 1,775 feet, then began a right turn. And then, the turn steepened. Bank angle passed 60 degrees. Nose pitching down, beyond negative 10 degrees. Airspeed racing, through 140 knots. And the descent, over 11,000 feet per minute. That's not just a descent, that's a plunge. A witness nearby described the airplane at a low altitude in a steep right-hand bank, moving fast. The engine wasn't sputtering. In fact, it sounded like it was running at full power. That's the crazy part. This wasn't a power plant issue. The engine was screaming, but the plane was out of control. And this is where we get into spatial disorientation, the silent killer. When you lose all outside visual cues at night, your inner ear starts lying to you. It makes you feel like you're straight and level when you're not. You can be rolling, diving, accelerating, and your body swears you're flying normally. Pilots call it the leans. In more severe cases, you enter what's known as the graveyard spiral, banking tighter and tighter without realizing it until you're in an unrecoverable dive. That's exactly what the flight profile shows here, and here's the harsh truth. Even trained pilots are not immune. If you're not absolutely locked onto your instruments, the inner ear wins every single time. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, both people in that cockpit were pilots. Surely that's an advantage, right? Well, not really, and here's why. The pilot in command, Will Lyons, held a commercial certificate. He had about 860 hours total time, which is respectable, but here's the problem. Only 2.8 hours of actual instrument time logged, and about 27 hours of night flying in the last six years. That's practically nothing when you're talking about night IMC departures. His wife, Jeanette, was even more qualified on paper. She was an airline transport pilot with over 2,300 hours, but she hadn't logged any recent flights in small piston airplanes. Her recent training? All in a Phnom 300 business jet, and flying a modern jet with autopilot, advanced avionics, and company procedures is a whole different world compared to hand flying a 1962 Cessna through a black hole night departure. And this is the subtle but extremely important point an ATP certificate doesn't automatically make you proficient in every aircraft type or situation. Proficiency 
is perishable. If you haven't flown a certain type of airplane or a certain kind of operation in months, your skills are rusty, dangerously rusty. So the cockpit may have looked like it had two pros sitting in it, but in reality, both of them were outside their comfort zone for those exact conditions. Will didn't have recent instrument or night proficiency, and Jeanette, despite her total time, wasn't current in small GA piston flying. That mismatch of hours on paper versus real readiness is a huge factor here. Now here's where the investigation took a really unsettling turn. The toxicology results on Jeanette, the ATP-rated pilot sitting in the right seat, came back with a cocktail of substances in her system. We're talking diphenhydramine, that's basically Benadryl, and a common ingredient in over-the-counter sleep aids. She also had quetiapine, better known as Seroquel, which is a heavy-duty prescription drug often used for bipolar disorder or off-label for sleep. On top of that, hydroxyzine, another sedating drug. And finally, traces of dextromethorphan, the cough syrup ingredient. Now, why does that matter? Because the FAA is crystal clear on this stuff. Quetiapine and hydroxyzine are straight up do not fly medications. Diphenhydramine, while common, is notorious for lingering in your system far longer than people realize. The FAA tells pilots to wait a full 60 hours, that's two and a half days, before flying after taking it. That's how impairing it can be. And here's the thing. We don't even need to speculate whether Jeanette was flying the plane or not. Even if she wasn't touching the controls, her role as a second set of eyes, a safety net, a backup brain in that cockpit was probably compromised. Crew resource management only works if both pilots are sharp and alert. But if one of them is drowsy, slowed, or not fully engaged because of medications, then effectively you've only got one pilot. And in this case, that one pilot was already task saturated and behind the airplane. And it's not just this crash. We've seen again and again that medications sneak into GA accidents. Pilots underestimate side effects. They think, hey, it's just over the counter. I'll be fine. But diphenhydramine alone is known to slow reaction times as badly as alcohol. Combine that with prescription sedatives. That's not just risky. It's downright crazy. But let's not stop at the meds. The other big killer in this story is fatigue and human pressure. Remember, the couple had been flying since that morning. By the time of this last leg, they had already been in and out of airplanes for over eight and a half hours. That is a marathon day in the cockpit. Mental fatigue at that point is not subtle. It's real, and it degrades your ability to scan instruments, make quick corrections, and resist the tricks your body plays on you in IMC. Now add in the psychology. They were just 21 miles from their destination. That's a 10-minute hop. They even stopped at Cliburn to add more fuel, just in case, of a missed approach at Granbury. That right there tells us they knew the weather was tough. They weren't oblivious. They prepared, but they still pressed on. And this is where get their itis creeps in. It's late. You've got your spouse sitting next to you. You've got your dog in the back. And home is just right over there. You can almost taste it. The temptation to say let's just get this over with, is overwhelming. But in aviation, that mindset is lethal, because fatigue plus night IMC is one of the most unforgiving combinations you can ever fly into. It multiplies every tiny slip. It robs you of mental bandwidth. And when spatial disorientation hits, forget it. You're already behind, and you never catch up. So, what do we learn from this? There are some brutally clear takeaways. Number one, night plus IMC is not just hard, it is deadly if you're not absolutely proficient. Don't launch into a 300-foot ceiling at night unless you are current, rested, and sharp. Number two, proficiency matters more than paper ratings. Will had a commercial ticket, Jeanette had an ATP, on paper, that cockpit looked stacked, but neither was truly current in the type of flying they were doing. Hours don't save you if you're rusty where it counts. Number three, medications. This one makes me shake my head. A shocking number of pilots fly under the influence of over-the-counter stuff like Benadryl, thinking it's harmless. The FAA bans it for a reason. Always, always check the do not fly list. If in doubt, don't. Number four, set hard personal minimums. Legal limits are just that, legal. They're not safe for everyone every time. For example, many cautious pilots say, no night IMC departures after more than six hours of flying in a day. That's a personal rule that might have saved this couple's lives. Number five, 
Crew Resource Management in GA. Two pilots in the cockpit doesn't automatically mean two minds on the problem. It only works if both are fit, clear on roles, and actually effective. If one is impaired, fatigued, or inexperienced in type, the safety margin is gone. Jeanette and Will Lyons had the qualifications. They had the hours. But in aviation, qualifications on paper mean nothing if you make the wrong decisions in practice. One risky choice, at the very end of a long day, costs them everything. Their story is a tragic reminder that sometimes the hardest decision for a pilot is also the safest one. To stop, to wait, and to say, not tonight. If you found this analysis valuable, do me a favor, hit subscribe, share it with another pilot. You know, because these lessons don't just honor their memory, they can literally save lives.